Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Rules in writing, words and cool stuff. This week, I have a meaty middle about animal sounds and a familect story. Let's get started. Here's a question for you. In what world do barag, toot, toro, ba, pao pao, and oo oo all mean the same thing? It's in the wild world of animal sounds and how they're expressed in different human languages. Those sounds I just made, they're all words for the sound an elephant makes when it trumpets, expressed respectively in English, Finnish, German, Italian, Japanese, and Russian. And this phenomenon, whereby an animal sound is expressed quite differently in different languages, isn't limited to elephants. For example, in English, we think of a mouse going squeak. But in German, it goes peep, peep. And in Japanese, choo, choo. And in English, we think of dogs going woof or rough. But in Danish, they go va, vav. In German, wa, wow. In Russian, gav, gav. And in French, ua, ua. I think I'm getting at least close with those pronunciations. Forgive me if I'm not. The diversity is so great that it inspired Derek Abbott, a professor at the University of Adelaide in Australia, to put together a giant online spreadsheet just to list them. When I was a child, said Abbott, it frustrated me that I couldn't find these types of words in a dictionary. That drove me to start creating my own list. He did this by polling scientists he met at international conferences and asking them what would be written in the text balloon coming from the mouth in cartoons of various animals. Clever. So far, 27 scientists from 17 different countries have answered him. Despite the strangeness of their request, Abbott says they're always delighted to help. So what gives? Why do different languages have such different versions of what are essentially the same sounds? Isn't everyone around the world just imitating observable natural phenomenon? Well, yes and no. The words for the sounds that animals make are onomatopoeias. That means they're formed from an existing sound and are intended to imitate that sound. For example, plink is an onomatopoeia. It's based on the real-life sound of water falling on a hard or metallic surface. Crunch is also an onomatopoeia. It's based on the sound of something dry, like leaves or crackers being compacted. But onomatopoeic words aren't created in a vacuum. They're created using the existing sound system of a language. A sound system, also known as a phonemic system, is the collection of sounds and sound combinations that are used over and over again in a given language. For example, the sound system of Spanish includes the rolling R you hear in the words perro and roja. That sound doesn't exist in English, as you can probably tell by how badly I just did it. German includes a vowel sound made of O-E you can hear in the name Goethe. That sound doesn't exist in English either. And some African languages include clicks and stops that are heard in hardly any other languages worldwide. These sound systems are learned very early in life. Even before babies can speak real words, their babbling mimics the sounds and intonations they hear every day. In fact, that's why adults who learn a second language have such a hard time speaking it without the accent of their native language. The muscles of their vocal organs have been conditioned since birth to form the sounds that are distinctive to their language. It can be almost impossible to train them to perform the movements needed to express new pronunciations. All of this helps explain why different languages have developed different words for animal sounds. In short, the phonemic system of a particular language puts a boundary around how onomatopoeic words can be formed. To put it another way, our animal sounds are really interpretations, filtered through the limited number of phonemes our languages possess. Linguist Erica Okrant has a YouTube video that provides some great examples of how this works. In Japanese, she notes, words can't begin with a Q-U sound, so a duck can't say quack quack. Instead, the sound of a duck in Japanese is rendered as ga ga. 
Likewise, she notes Japanese doesn't allow the combination of a D and an L sound. So roosters can't cry cock-a-doodle-doo. Instead, in Japanese, they say koki koko. Another linguist, Anthea Fraser Gupta, points out that in Mandarin Chinese, words can't end with an F sound. So dogs don't say woof in Chinese. They say wang. Words for animal sounds also, to an extent, reflect the role that animals play in a given culture. Derek Abbott tells us that one of the things that surprised him when making his spreadsheet of animal sounds was the obsessive diversity of dog sounds in English. There's woof woof, ruff ruff, yap yap, arf arf, bow wow, and yelp and yip. Other languages have many fewer words. Greek, for example, has just one, gov gov. Dutch has two, and they're almost identical, waf waf and woof woof. We don't know exactly why this is, but it could be because of the outsized role that dogs have played over the years in the lifestyles and cultures of English-speaking countries. Similarly, Swedish is the only language on Abbott's chart to have a sound for the noise a moose makes. Brule. This may be because there are more moose in Sweden per square kilometer than in any other country in the world. So that's your tip for today. The names we give animal sounds aren't straight-up imitations of those sounds. They're interpretations of those sounds, filtered through the phonemes of a given language. That's why each language's interpretation of those sounds may be different. Why are there different sound systems in different languages? That's a bigger question and one for another podcast. Until then, I hope the neighborhood dog doesn't ooh-ooh-ooh at you, because if you're speaking Japanese, that would mean it's growling. The animal sounds all came from freesound.org. The elephant was by Vata, the water dropping was from Besku, and the crunching was from Inspector J, who can also be found at jshaw.co.uk. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Next, I have a kitchen table lingo story. Here's Abby. Hi, Mignon. My name is Abby Summer. I live in Racine, Wisconsin. Um, I was calling to talk to you about my family slang. Both of my parents grew up in Buffalo, New York, and they were from mixed Polish, German, Italian ancestry. And we live now here in Wisconsin, and I'm the only person I know, my family is the only people I know, who call the little twist ties that you get for the produce bags at the grocery store a gitchy, G-I-T-C-H-Y. They swear that that's what everybody calls it. It was the old um, immigrant slang back in Buffalo back in in the 60s. But uh, when I say it to other people around here, just because it's the normal way that my family talks, they all look at me like I have three heads. So, uh, but the funny thing is that I have a three-year-old daughter and I heard my dad say it to her the other day when we were at their house and she knew exactly what he was talking about. So it's obviously getting passed down to a new generation, the Gitchy. So what a cool project this is listening to everybody's family slang. I can't wait to hear the stories. Hope you're well. Thanks. Thanks, Abby. If you'd like to share your family story, the story about a word that your family and only your family uses, you can leave a voicemail at 833214GIRL. That's 833214GIRL, and you might hear it on the show. Be sure to tell me the reason your family uses the word, because that's always the best part. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. This show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and you can find articles that go with each major segment of the show at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 